Today's guest says before you can launch into the promise of your future, you have to deal with the challenges from your past. He is a powerful author and a speaker and a motivator, and his name is Ramal Toon. The name of his book is called Love is an Inside Job. We're going to talk with Ramal Toon today here on Babby's House. Stay tuned. Babby's House is on its way to you right now. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to Babby's House. I'm the host of the show, Babby Mason, and thank you so very much for joining me. My very special guest today is Ramal Toon, and he is a fine young man, very focused and very purposeful. And I love the title of his book. It's called Love is an Inside Job. And he talks about getting vulnerable with God before you can launch into what God has before you in your present and in your future. You have to deal with the weight, with the burdens, with the stuff of the past and get real with God. And his book is all about being vulnerable and, and taking the stuff from your past and just laying it all out before God and walking into your destiny. We're going to talk with Ramal Toon in just one moment. But since love is our theme for the show, I'm going to sing one of my very favorite songs that I wrote many years ago, but the truth of it still stands today. Love is the more excellent way. of men and angels But if I don't have a love I'm just a clanging cymbal I can have the faith to remove the mountains But if I don't If I don't have a love, does it profit?
Thank you for coming back to the show. My very special guest today is Ramal Toon, and he is the author of Love is an Inside Job, Getting Vulnerable with God. I'll tell you, that subtitle speaks volumes, doesn't it? Well, let's talk to the author right now, Ramal Toon. Thank you for being on the show today, my friend. Thank you so much Absolutely. for having me. Absolutely. So happy to have you. And it's, it's very interesting to hear a man talk about vulnerability and, and getting real with God and just laying the truth of who we are, all out there in the open for God to deal with. Yeah. What, what led to that journey? Yeah, I think uh, for me, it was a lot of grappling with my own story. Uh, my mom had passed of lung cancer almost 11 years ago, and I had come from some really challenging you know, circumstances growing up, and I, it caused me to think about who am I really in the world? And I felt like I was hiding a part of my story, the parts that I was ashamed of. And so that one night after asking that question, I went to God in prayer and went to look at the Bible again and really realized that I had not surrendered a lot of my pain to God, even in my pursuit of success and all that I had attained. There were still some wounded places that, allowed, that were keeping me from having real joy. Yes, I love the, the subtitles and the titles in your, in your book. Mm -hmm. And one of them, of course the whole book stands out, but one of them particularly just just really leapt out at me. And it's in chapter one, when in quotes, this is what I read, when the parts of me I didn't love led to a revolt. And you know, when you're dealing with the uh, past and parts of your life and you know, the baggage that your parents bring and the, the circumstances of your family and those kinds of things, like, past, the past, dealing with the past can get messy. And as you say, it can lead to a revolt. It can just yeah. reach back and reach up and just knock you to your feet. Yeah. But talk to me about what that means when the parts of me I didn't love led a revolt. Yeah, for me, it was the parts of my story that I didn't want to deal with, that I wanted to ignore. A lot of the pain, the emotional trauma, the verbal abuse, the challenges mm. of growing up in poverty, the absence of my dad, and different dynamics that I wanted to act like didn't happen in the pursuit of a better life. And what was and, the process yeah. of dealing with these things? What did you do to begin this process? Well, I had to realize that uh, I had these life-limiting beliefs, and as much as I wanted to attain, there were parts of my belief systems and thoughts that led me to believe I couldn't. And so I had to, through therapy, um, revisit some of those stories, those things that had shaped my self-doubt, my self-worth, and what I could attain in life, and look at what did these experiences take from me and how can I get it back? You know, a lot of people, particularly Christians, many Christians, and uh, and black people, uh, to a great degree, think, well, you know, if you got God, you, you don't need to be going in there talking and, quote, no therapist and, and getting all honest and getting vulnerable and with a complete stranger and all of that. All right. Talk to me about the power of therapy and what it has done to help you heal. Yeah, you know, you're ex exactly right, because as a man, we're conditioned oftentimes not to feel, to, you know, stand up on your own two feet, don't cry. And pull yourself up by Pull your yourself boots. up, and, you know, so then what, you know, I thought about it in all of my experiences, even in dating and marriage, um, I wasn't prepared to be an emotionally available person, you know. You grow up saying, don't cry, be a man, be strong, and then you meet a woman who says, tell me how you feel. <laughs> and you don't know what to do with that. Yeah. And so I had to realize that, one, therapy honored my faith. That in as much as I wanted to live into God's purpose for my life, I had to deal with the hindrances that I could not take my baggage into my destiny. And so I had to deal with what, what was holding me back? What were the parts of my story that needed healing and redemption? And revisiting some of those narratives. The past is messy sometimes, but God turns that mess into a miracle if you're man enough and woman enough to confront it. Let's talk about one of those things that um, you probably dealt with and many of us have to deal with if we want to be whole and if we want to walk into the future baggage free, and that is shame. Yeah. Um, talk to me about 
how you how you dealt with issues of shame you know in writing love is an inside job there were some challenging stories that i wanted to share and i kind of had that feeling of what are people going to think and the first thing that came to my mind was there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ and I believed and still do that I wasn't sharing it for myself I was sharing these stories and the process of healing for other people to know that there is life on the other side of it that there is healing and there is redemption um, and the key I always tell folks you know you don't show people your wounds, because when you do that, you're just bleeding all over everybody, and that's not helpful. Everybody walks out of the room depressed. But you show people your scars, because your scars are the evidence of healing. They have a story behind them, and they, they are evidence to other people that healing is available to them, too. Amen. That's powerful. I want to talk with you about the fact that um, these issues that you faced and the fact that you said you didn't, you're not necessarily telling these stories and writing this book just for the sake of telling your story, but you're telling your story for the sake of others that they might be healed. Yeah. And this really is a common story. Yeah. Um, many people, you know, regardless of the details, many of us in one reason or another deal with issues of the past. We deal with baggage from our family. We deal with um, issues that cause us shame and guilt. Um, that run real deep. And I, I appreciate the fact that you say that you write it, you wrote the book for others because there is power in telling your story so that others might be healed because yeah. we have many of the same things in common. Yes. And, and that is very powerful. Well, uh, talk to me about your own walk with the Lord um, because faith plays a real huge part in your, your uh, story. It's at the core. Yeah. yeah. So talk to us about how you came to know the Lord. It's uh, another uh, story from college. I served in the military uh, during Desert Storm. And mm -hmm. after that, went to Howard University. And I had a girlfriend who went to church. I didn't grow up in the church. And she said, look, I go to church. So if you want to be with me, you got to go to church. I said, hey, praise the Lord. So uh, <laughs> I ended up in church. And my journey with Christ was one that um, began with the assumption that I had to learn how to do church and how to fit in and that uh, my story was something that wasn't relevant uh, in this context. And then one day during a Wednesday night, uh, you know, service and they asked for testimonies and I started to share my story of growing up with a mom who was a substance abuser and alcoholic and I had to panhandle to get to and from school and my mom eventually got off drugs through a church rehab program and, you know, I went on to graduate with honors from Howard and Duke. After that, there was a complete silence. and. People no longer saw me through the lens of all that God had done in my life, but through the lens of my past. And I was then defined by the fact that I grew up in these circumstances and that I, my appearance, there was more to the story. And it kind of hurt me. I was, there was a little shame in that. And so it made me silence my story in order to fit in and do church. And I resisted that. That's where, you know, when you don't love all of who you are, the parts of you you don't love will cause a revolt. That revolt was in the fact that the wounded part of me um, was yearning for love. And my answer to the question of do you love me was not yet. I love myself enough when I buy a big enough house, when I have enough money, when I am esteemed by the right people. And it wasn't delivering on the promise. And I had to just sit down with myself and really deal with, with everything that I have, the biggest hindrance to my peace and, and my yearning for joy was me. The fact that I, I was not dealing with this story that I had continued to accept as true uh, about myself so that I could heal it, redeem what it took for me, and truly live into God's destiny for my life. And now I love my life. Nothing has changed, but I've learned to love me because I've learned to fully embrace the love of God. Can I say thank you um, to you? Because, you know, the, the um, you know, it seems in the press that the black man is just getting a bad rap. You know, it, he's just, he is just um, often cast in a, a dark light. He's, he's, he's stereotyped. He's um, typecast, you know, in real life. And um, I'm, I'm married to a wonderful black man. I raised two fine sons. Um, my dad was a great preacher and pastor. My brothers are all serving the Lord. 
and you you are a, a fine man who loves thank God you. and can I just say thank you for thank just you. making God look so good and um, but I'm sure that there are men who may be watching the show who are caught up in that cycle you know of, of alcoholism in the past and what everybody has said about the black man he just can't seem to catch a, a you know a, um, a start. Can you encourage him? Yeah, I think what I would say to other brothers is that um, as a man who's supposed to stand on his own two feet and be courageous and, and get things done, um, that also means you get to define your manhood on your own terms. And the reality is that other people didn't create you, so they can't tell you what you were created for. To be a man for me means that if I truly want joy and want to offer that to the people that I love, I got to find my source of joy. And I will do whatever that takes as a man to make that happen. So be courageous enough to go to therapy, be man enough to admit you don't have all the emotional skills uh, to have a healthy relationship and then do the work that it takes. Um, that's just critical to the essence of not only manhood, but being man enough to stand on your own two feet and make healthy emotional decisions just as much as you make healthy professional decisions. Uh, for me, you know, the thing about black maleness is that we're led to believe that a strong black man carries the burdens and the struggles of the black community. And that if you go to therapy, it says that you're not man enough to endure the struggle. Um, it actually makes no sense. A man should heal from the oppression and heal from the struggle and heal his pain so that he can walk fully liberated and then be the God and liberator of his family. That's but powerful. you can't take people where you are, haven't been trying to go yourself. That's powerful. And you just recently got engaged. I did, so we Saturday. Congratulations Thank on you. that just a few days ago. When we come back from this break, we're just going to talk about, you know, about taking that freedom of who you are into this next chapter of your life. Stay with us after this break. We'll talk with Ramal Toon in just a little bit more. So stick around. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Babby's House. I've been talking today with Ramal Toon, and he is the author of Love is an Inside Job. I love that title. The subtitle is Getting Vulnerable with God, and it's been so refreshing to talk with you, Ramal, about just getting, as you say, getting light for the flight. I love that. And you're getting married in a little bit. You just got engaged. Congratulations again on Thank that. You. I see that beautiful smile. Your face, <laughs> your face just lights up. Oh, Life is man. Good. Love is an inside job, Indeed isn't it? Indeed it, it is. Really, indeed it is. It just does something to your heart. It does. And so you're going to be married here in a few uh, weeks, months? Next year. Next year? June 25th, 2019. Very good. It's Congrats. her parents' anniversary. V your parents' anniversary. Her parents. Her yeah. parents. Isn't that beautiful? Mm. Is it possible, you know, as you're talking about venturing into this next chapter of your life, is it possible to just be baggage free? Uh, or do we just all, do we carry some residual uh, baggage into wherever we go? You know, I think there's always the challenge of carrying a residue of past pain with you. And that's why for me, prayer, meditation, and therapy are important. Um, but you can be light for the flight. You can put a weight. I always tell my fiance when things come up, I don't carry anything that's not mine. And some of the things that happened in my story and my past were not mine to carry. That was the result of someone else's pain being perpetuated on my life. And so in healing it, I can let that stuff go because it's not mine to take with me on my journey and the purpose. It's like, you know, you travel a lot, right? And it's like carrying a bag that you have to check when it's overweight. They tell you, you can take some stuff out and leave it, but if you take everything with you, you're gonna have to pay a price to carry all this baggage. And sometimes we carry things that we've been paying the price for for too long. So it's really about looking through your stuff and seeing what's worth taking with you and what's not, uh, real, doing that real assessment. And after I paid that extra for that overweight bag and I get to my destination and I say, I really didn't, didn't even use, need it. <laughs> didn't use it all. Some stuff, and in life, there are things we like taking with us, even pain, because we're used to carrying it mm -hmm. wherever we want to go. And then we'll pray and say, God, open this door and do this, you know, perform this miracle. And God is saying yes, but you can't walk into that place of miracle and destiny carrying that stuff because you, you'll mess it all up. 
And so in dealing with the story and healing from the baggage, you can be light for the flight and you might carry some residue. I think because we're constantly becoming, you know, the Bible says it does not yet appear, right? But in that process of becoming, we're also assessing and learning uh, what's ours to carry and what's not. And as we shed that weight, uh, we see ourselves in a different light. You know, I'm able to love more deeply now uh, because I've learned to fully love me. Yes, that's powerful, very powerful. So talk to us about your, your main occupation. What is it that you do for a living? Yeah, so I spend 50% of my time, maybe a little bit more, as Vice President of Strategic Partnerships at TMS Global. It's a global missions organization. I'm a, responsible for building those strategic relationships uh, in the U.S. and abroad with organizations as well as churches. And then I spend the other part of my time speaking uh, and, and you know, signing books at different conferences and at churches and colleges around the country as well as in a few other countries. I do some work in Nairobi, Kenya, and Accra, Ghana, and in Johannesburg and Cape Town. Oh, that's powerful. So is this, um, this challenge of carrying our stuff from our past, is that, a, is that something that is universal to man, or is it more typical in the U.S. to have these challenges? What are you seeing on a global level? Yeah, the human condition is the same no matter, no matter where you go. Uh, even though my story is unique to my childhood experiences and the challenge that we had to overcome, um, everyone has a story. And all of us share the same emotions, the same sadness, fears, anxieties, doubts, the same desires and hopes and dreams. They may look different um, based on our lives, but the feelings behind them are the same. And so wherever I go, it's the same story, mm -hmm. but I'm always hearing from people, I can relate to that. You know, I've met millionaires and billionaires who say, our lives are so different, but the pain and challenges you had with your dad, that's mine too. And I've had to overcome some of that. The fears and anxieties, that's a part of my story too. Um, so we're much more alike than we are different. Mm -hmm. And we have a responsibility a friend of mine said recently, to whom much is given, much is expected. And people tend to think that's about money and stuff, but it's also about the blessing of healing. And as much as you've been healed, so much more is expected of you to be an agent of healing in someone else's life. That's powerful. The challenges are universal, and the answer is the same too. Absolutely. Because Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there is no other. Jesus Amen. is the only way. Amen. Ramal Toon, thanks for being my guest Thank today, you my so friend. Much it's for been a joy me. talking with you today. And again, the name of the book is called Love is an Inside Job, Getting Vulnerable with God. And of course, we, we can find the book. Tell, tell us where we can find, find it. Find all major book selling outlets, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, Books a Million. It's pretty much everywhere you look and purchase your books. Very good. Thanks okay. again for being with us. Thank you. And thank you, my dear friend, for joining me here for Babby's House. And uh, I hope and pray that today's conversation has been uplifting and encouraging to you. And will you do me a favor? Will you reach out to me at Babby.com or on Facebook at Babby Mason or Babby Mason Radio? And just let me know that you've heard today's show and that you've enjoyed this conversation and that you're living light for the flight. That's my word for the day. Be a light for the flight. And that's the way that you can be all that God has called you to be. He can stir up your gifts and you can maximize your potential and do some things for God and live through your gifts and just serve God through your hands, through your mouth, and through your heart. Well, God bless you and thanks again for joining me here at Babby's House. Until next time, may God bless you real good. Mm -hmm.